Hello everyone and welcome to episode 32 of the chess.com rapid rating climb series. For those of you new to the channel, let me just quickly play a move so the game doesn't abort. My name is Alex and the point of this series is to get to 2000 ELO while explaining my thought process while playing rapid games and then in the post game analysis we can use the computer and the fact that I can actually play the moves on the board instead of like drunk drawing a bunch of arrows and expecting you to follow along. So that I can like deeper delve into the ideas of the opening and go a bit further into some lines that I was calculating while playing. The aim is basically just to educate you guys and maybe even have a good time while we're at it so that everyone can improve their chess. We are getting very close to the goal of 2000 ELO. We are only 19 ELO off and if we win this game we get 7 ELO. Very close to the end of the series but when the series ends, I'm considering just basically starting it again, going back down to like a thousand ELO and doing the whole journey because you guys seem to be really enjoying it. If you want to check out the previous episodes, check the playlist below. And with that being said, we will play our second move, which is D5, the Karo Khan defense. I've been playing this at some incredibly high accuracies in some episodes of the rating climb recently. And let's see if I can replicate that today. So, my opponent takes and goes into the exchange variation. I'm expecting c4, which is known as the Panov attack, and it is quite popular. And I have a line that I recommend against the Panov if he plays the four knight variation, which is c4, knight c, sorry, c4, knight f6, knight c3, knight c6, and knight to f3. I have a specific line I like to play against that, because things can get quite complicated. The idea is to try and leave white with an isolated d-pawn in a lot of these pan-off positions, but he might not play that. He could go for moves like c3 and bishop d3 and just play a more closed central structure. So he starts with knight to f3. It's not really committing to anything. We're going to go knight c6. We could have played knight to f6, but I was just a little bit worried about a knight landing on e5 and maybe taking control of this diagonal. Probably not a problem, but the moves should be pretty interchangeable. Again, here he can play c4 and go into a typical Panov line, but he may not. He may not. He could play bishop d3. He could play c3. He could even play a move like bishop to f4. So he kind of just has creative reign here. But I feel like this this sort of structure is quite just quite simple to play from the black side. You know, you kind of just develop normally, bring the knight out, maybe bring the bishop out or play e6 and bring this bishop out and you can feed in Keto in the future or put the bishop on d7. Our opponent goes bishop to d3 and we're just again going to keep things nice and simple with knight to f6. Apparently we just transposed to the Indian game Spielman Indian variation. Which was definitely the intention. <laughs> I definitely know what that is. Doesn't really matter. It's just classic chess.com. Like when you transpose position. It will say that you did. But I have no idea what that means. In all honesty. I like to stick to the openings that I know. Because it makes things easy. It means I don't have to study a ton of theory. And waste a load of time. And I can just focus on learning the themes of the openings that I do like to play. So my opponent goes for c3 and goes for this kind of setup. Bishop g4 is quite a tempting move for me now. I don't know whether I would have played bishop g4 if he'd have gone for ideas of c4. Because c4 could like try and compromise my light squares on the queen side. And this might this diagonal might become a bit weak. But now he's committed to c3. Bishop g4 looks quite logical. He might go knight d2 just to support the knight. But then we can even try moves like e5 to try and break quickly in the center. Which is a typical idea of the Karo Khan. Especially when your opponent doesn't attack your center immediately with a move like c4. So, bishop g4. I'm honestly just expecting him to castle. Then I don't want to play e5 because after takes and knight takes he can play rook to e1 and play on this pin. The position's probably still fine, but I don't really want to go into it. Okay, he goes h3. We're not going to take, because we have no need to. Now, in the previous episode, we had a Karo Khan, and my opponent played h3. 
and I took immediately because it made sense. Again, if you want to learn the Karakan, I'd check out that episode because it explains a lot of the ideas of the advanced variation of the Karakan, where it's much more common to trade. And you'll figure out why if you watch that. But here, there's no point. We might as well just retreat. If he goes g4, then we put the bishop on g6, and we challenge his pretty strong bishop. You know, we want to put a bishop on d6 in a similar sort of way that he has. And those bishops can be very strong in these sorts of structures where these pawns protecting them kind of act as like an umbrella to make it difficult for other pieces to kind of oppose them. So the best way is just by using another bishop. And that seems like what he's going to try and do if we put a bishop on d6. Which we probably will do, to be honest. And this might lead to a few exchanges. It might make it difficult for us to actually win this. But you do have to be objective. And you do have to be pragmatic. And even though I'd like to preserve the pieces, I still have to play the best moves. So we're going to go bishop to d6 because I believe it's the best move even though it offers him an exchange. And yes, I want to win this game. Maybe just makes it a bit more drawish by offering him an exchange, but I have to be pragmatic. Again, you do have to watch out for moves like knight to e5 in these sorts of positions, but here that's not possible because the knight is pinned to the queen. Had my opponent played g4 in this position and then... I don't know, did something else, then I would have been less likely to play bishop to d6. So I would have been more worried about knight e5. But here that's not a problem because the knight is pinned, like I said. And if he had gone in this position, g4, then we would have just taken the bishop. Instead of retreating and allowing knight e5, we would have, after g4, just takes takes. He would have ruined his structure. We would have had an incredibly powerful dark squared bishop. And we'd be completely winning. This pawn is weak as well. Anyway. But my opponent knows that. He's playing logical moves. E5 is on the cards. But again, I'm a little bit worried about a rook ending up on E1. While my king is still in the centre. So we're going to castle. And now E5 is more of an idea. To try and play on the fact that his knight is pinned. And his bishop is a little bit vulnerable. Normally what happens is after a move like e5 takes takes, the bishop goes back to e2 to break the pin and make, if like I take, it's not that useful. Um, and then we might just put our bishop on g6 to claim this diagonal for ourselves if he steps off of it. We're going to end up with an isolated pawn if we go for that sort of position, but it could give us an absolute ton of activity, which we're going to try and claim is worth the isolated pawn. So okay, like I said, the, the position is very, very equal. It could well end in a draw. And sometimes that's just what happens. Especially from the black side. If you play well, the best you can get sometimes is a draw. But this is early doors. I'm you know, I'm saying this as if my opponent's going to play perfectly. That is unlikely to happen. He's high rated. You know, 1886 is no joke of a rating. He's a good player. Uh... And he looks like a young Indian kid as well, which is obviously a scary prospect <laughs> considering the recent candidates tournament with Prague and Gukesh playing incredibly well as young Indian kids. I don't know whether you call them kids anymore, but you know what I mean. But you know, he's oh, 2011, so what, that would make him like 13. Yeah, mad. Anyway, sorry. Tangent. He goes queen to c2. So we know we now no longer pin his knight to his queen, and he's setting up this battery. Our knight defends h7 for now, but also makes e5 less of a nice move. So if takes, 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 rook e1. We could go bishop g6 to try and contest the diagonal. I am also tempted to play rook a to c1 to set up ideas of knight to b4 and knight to d4 playing on the pin also looking at ideas like this uh, forking so that looks very tempting yep i don't see why we shouldn't play that again he could just play a move like a3 to stop this move from working but our rook is always going to be better placed on c8 than a8 and we're essentially doing it with a tempo. 
This is basically a tempo gaining move. He does not want to allow this to happen and a move like queen b1 and takes takes. Because then we're going to put this bishop on g6 and it's going to be a very powerful bishop. We're also going to get massive control over the e4 square if that happens. By not only removing one of his defenders of e4 but also adding one of our own with our bishop. And my game is kind of freezing. Okay, it's cool now. I don't know how my computer literally lags on chess.com. Like, it's a good uh, piece of hardware. It's got, like, i7 and RTX graphics. So, and by the way, <laughs> I, I, I barely play video games other than chess. But I just got a powerful... It's a gaming laptop, basically. So I can play historical strategy games. If any of you know the Total War series, yo, let me know. Because Rome Total War was my childhood. Um, unbelievable game. Anyway, I, can't, I keep going on tangents. <laughs> my opponent goes uh, a3, which, like I said, stops this. I'm tempted to play rook f to d8 to set up ideas. Wait. What am I setting up ideas of? Um, I've lost my train of thought. No, wait, rook um, fd8 doesn't do anything. I don't know why I was thinking about that. But okay, like, you know, we basically traded the move rook a to c8 for a3. And obviously putting a rook on c8 is far better than putting a pawn on a3. So that's a little win. That's how we get a little positional advantage in our favor i'm going to try and build on that i would love if we could take this and then take here but he's just going to take back the knight and it's going to replace the previous knight knight e4 is something i'm looking at because bishop takes pawn takes knight takes then this knight is destabilized and this pawn is destabilized but if we go knight to e4 then he could just take take and take with the queen and then we don't have anything. Again, bishop g6 could be a move. But I feel like it's a little premature to play that. If I could transport a knight onto the f4 square, that would be amazing, by the way. But that's not how chess works. But this is how plans develop. Because imagine we had the h5 square. I could do something like this. I don't think it works quite as well if you have bishop g6 first and then go for this. Because one of the reasons that I on putting that on f4 would be good is because it attacks the bishop. But if we go bishop g6, he can just trade. That might still be a good idea, though. It might still be a good idea. But I want to see if there's anything better. Of course, you've always got to look for that. Queen f4 might be nice. Does it threaten anything? Maybe it prepares a knight to e4 it can be kicked out of g3 though queen f4 looks a little bit unstable i feel like maybe it's good maybe inducing g3 and then just retreating is good but i'm not sure not sure so okay let's consider e5 a bit more seriously e5, take, 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 here, obviously if he goes knight f3 we take it, so rook e1, I'd like to put queen f4 but then he can go rook to e7, so if we put the queen back on um, d6, we just have an isolated d pawn. Bishop g6 might be the best idea here. We could play a move like a6, preparing b5, just to take more space and kind of pass the move back over to him. We could also play rook f e8 to prepare e5 in the future. That could that could be a good move. I mean, rook f e8 is never going to be a bad move, is it? Let's do it. The only move we have to be a bit careful of is c4. 
but there's I just don't believe that works because of the alignment of the rook and the queen. I have no faith in that move. And I would love him to play it. As long as my knight maintains control of h7, we should be good in terms of his battery. So again, just something to watch out for and make sure you're always considering when calculating variations here. But there's nothing that can kick this knight off of the f6 square. If he ever puts a knight on e5, we're fine as well. Whoa. Okay, so his point is he wants to take control of the c5 square, but he must have missed this. No, that that can't work. That can't work. Okay, well, obviously we take that. No brainer. He must have missed that. Because, I mean, our bishop's been there for so long, like, since move 7, this has just sat there, and I haven't taken the whole time. So he might have just forgotten about it, because my, bishop, my bishop's just been sat there doing nothing. But, oh my god. This is looking scary for him. So, candidate moves. Queen f4 I like. Just putting pressure on and transferring my queen over. E5 I also like. If he takes, then knight takes, or even rook takes, trying to lift the rook over. But probably knight takes, targeting a bunch of light squares in the position. Again, this knight needs to maintain maintain control of h7. My compromise, I believe, is queen to f4, because we attack this. He can defend it in a few ways. Quite a few ways, actually. But I want to go queen f4, and then however he defends it, we follow up with e5. So we get the same idea, except my queen is already in the attack. This is not a move I'm concerned about whatsoever. I can just play b6 and kick the knight out, and it's got nowhere useful to go. So this looks like a very nice move to me. Also, I could potentially transfer the queen over. Again, this is a nice idea, but I don't want to hang h7. So I'm going to play queen f4. This looks completely winning. Yeah, this looks devastating. E5. Could even potentially push E4, given the opportunity. This looks horrible. And remember, if he uh, moves the knight, then these ideas still exist. I don't think there's anything better than e5. We need to try and open up the lines against the king so we can get more pieces into the attack. Because currently we only have a queen. And queens are powerful, but they can't do everything, of course. We can also consider transferring the queen to the h4 or h5 square via a check on g5 at any moment if we want to. We may do that so that our knight can then access the f4 square and put pressure on the light squares in the white camp. So worth noticing because we're going to be able to do that with a tempo on the king as well. Or we could just do this in one move if we really wanted to and then try and transfer the knight. But again, I don't want to hang h7 for no reason, even if that might be fine. If this knight moves, we also have ideas of rook e6 and rook h6 in the right position. This is looking incredible. We are also just threatening to take this. So if he takes with the knight, then we take, and he can't take because of the pin on his queen. And if we take and he takes with the pawn, then we take with the knight, and then we have a double attack on his queen. And we're attacking f3, and we're attacking the knight, and it's game over. So, yeah, he doesn't have to take us, but this is also a threat. We could also maybe take with the knight, but I feel like it's better to take with the pawn, because if he doesn't take back, then we can put the knight on e5. And target a lot of the vulnerabilities in his position. And maybe even lift the rook via c4 in the right circumstance. Or via c6 of course. This should be completely game over. You can't just damage your kingside structure like that and get away with it. At least not here. When white's rooks are doing nothing, his knight looks pretty on c5. But it's going to be doing nothing of any use. His queen and his bishop look pretty on this diagonal, but they're shot down by a single knight, and his queen isn't really an asset. It's more of just a weakness because of these ideas. It's just 
like the queen being on c2 is literally weakening his center because it's meaning that this c pawn in many lines is going to be unable to help in the defense of his center yeah i knight to b3 was just so unnecessary he did not have to do that a move like rookie one would have been absolutely fine but hey he saw the c5 square and it looks juicy but like even if you get there i can just kick you out but okay okay e5 let's see what he does he's got a big decision to make and I don't know what he should do, in all honesty, because this looks like a really, really dire situation for my opponent. By the way, if you're enjoying the video so far, um, please drop a like and subscribe if you haven't already. I'd really appreciate it. As of the time of recording this video, I'm on like 967 subscribers. So I'm so close to 1,000 subs. And if I can get to 1,000 subs and get monetized properly by YouTube, this uh, channel is going to be way like more viable for me to put more time into and improve because if it actually makes me some money then I'm going to be way more liberal with the amount of time that I spend on it because it'll be worth my time a bit more like don't get me wrong I enjoy doing this but I can't just spend hours and hours and hours a day on the channel if it's not paying me anything I'm sure you guys understand um, and don't get me wrong, I'm not going to be getting paid anything significant, but it'll make it a little bit more worth my time. A move that's interesting here is queen to d2, offering a queen trade. But I think I can just take and then win the d pawn. And I'm only at one pawn, but his pawn structure is completely ruined, and I have a pass d pawn. Of course I could decline it with a move like queen to h4. And then this knight could actually try and get into f4 because this will no longer exist because the queen will have moved. But the simple option would be to just take and win a clean pawn. And then we also control the open files as well if that were to happen. And we have a very strong knight. Although this bishop is doing a good job of monitoring it. We'll see. We'll see what happens. To be fair, this is probably the first time in the Rating Climb series that I've been up on time. <laughs> That's, like, actually unheard of. Like, I'm always low on time. And I'm a slow player as it is, because I definitely, definitely prefer classical chess. Like, you know, at least an hour and 20 per player. It's definitely my best time format. Uh, like, relatively. So rapid is still kind of fast for me. And that's coupled with me explaining my moves. Like I literally spent a full minute. Uh, how long did I spend? Yeah, like a minute on the move d5. Just because I was giving an intro. Could I have given the intro before the game? Yeah, maybe. But that would be a bit too streamlined for the channel. Wouldn't you agree? <laughs> we don't do things like that over here. Um, that'd be, yeah, too much effort. Yeah, this position just looks so bad for him. And the, the more time he drains, the better a position it becomes for me. Because it's, it's so complicated. There's so much going on that I'm going to have enough time. You know, seven minutes is a while. Although I was, I was saying I like playing classical. Seven minutes is a fair bit of time. I'm going to have the time to be finding tactics and calculating more than he is going to be able to and he's going to need calculation trying to defend this position another interesting idea is putting the bishop on f5 which i just noticed which attacks the rook and it prepares to defend h3 so that could be an idea now i know i was talking about knight here but this is kind of annoying i know f3 is hanging in that particular situation Something that just popped into my mind is rook to e5 with the intention of playing rook to g5, forcing the king off of the defense of these pawns because the king will have to go to h1. Also disallows to move bishop f5 because we control that square. 
we go knight here, he might have the move knight d4, defending f3, like that. Whereas if we go rook e5, he can't do that because takes takes and the queen hangs. We can give this check um, intermediate so the rook doesn't get taken as well. Rook takes looks crushing, actually, because he's just letting us lift our rook. And he has no defenders on his king side. If he tries to play a move like king h1, we just take on f3. Rook e5 looks crushing. Completely. Just game over. I don't see how he transfers pieces to help in the defense. Knight d2. Huh, he just resigns. Yeah, I'm sure rook e5 was the best move. Knight e5. It's still, it's still winning. But it allows, I think, knight d4. Yeah, yeah it does. So rook e5 is just game over. He can't defend... You know, a move like knight d2, I was about to say, trying to defend f3, you could probably do something like this. Again, playing on this pin. And you have so much pressure on the white position now. Damn. Guys. Guys. <laughs> the game review says zero mistakes, zero blunders, zero misses. I've had quite a few videos recently that have been like 96, 97% accuracy, 2,500 performance rating. I know this was a short game, so it's not quite as viable, but this could be the clickbait that I'm using. Although it wouldn't technically be clickbait if it's true. I guess that could still be clickbait, but it'd be true for clickbait. So I think that's fair game. Let's check the game review. Another great game in the car row. Let's go. All right, apologies for the um, horrible looking layout, but just so you can see, 96.4% accuracy. We had a great move. Again, absolutely zero mistakes, as you can see here. Uh, no inaccuracies, no mistakes, no misses, no blunders. And uh, 2450. 2500 plus would technically be GM level, to be fair. I can give the 96.4% accuracy though. I think that's a fair clickbait to go for. Anyway, enough tooting my own horn. Let's get into some analysis. All right, guys. So, e4, c6, d4, d5. In this rating climb, we've had quite a few knight to c3s. We've also had quite a lot of two knights where d4 isn't played and knight f3, knight c3 are played. We've also had the advanced variation, which happened in the previous episode, which again, you can check out below if you haven't seen already. But today, we get e takes d5, the exchange. We take back, and like I was saying, I was expecting the panov with c4, and the line that I was referencing was this. And the best move is bishop g4, but this gets incredibly theoretical uh, after like takes, takes, bishop c4, and then moves like e6. It's very difficult because your bishop leaves the defense of the light squares around your king by coming out to g4. So what I prefer to play here is e6 straight away, which blocks your bishop in, but keeps your bishop around for defensive duties and just reinforces the center. I'm sure I've had a game in this variation maybe quite a while ago in the speed run. But one of my videos was definitely on the Panov attack, and I played this line, I'm sure. Anyhow, knight f3 is played by my opponent, which is just a little bit of a weird move. The knight normally doesn't belong on f3 in these particular setups. Normally it goes to e2 after the bishop develops, just because bishop g4 can be kind of annoying to deal with. We go knight c6, bishop d3. Again, my opponent could have transposed back into the Panov with c4. Knight f6, knight c3, but he doesn't. He goes bishop to d3. By the way, I keep talking about the panov because it's a really trendy line, and if you play the caro, you will see it a lot. People really enjoy playing the panov. Don't know why, but they do. Bishop d3, knight f6, c3, bishop g4. Again, my opponent could have castled here, but 
it doesn't really matter that much to be honest the move order is kind of interchangeable because there's no actual conflict in the center of the board we're all just getting our pieces where we want them right now so c3 bishop g4 h3 and yeah in the previous episode uh h3 was a terrible move because it just let me took take but here you don't want to take because he just develops his queen with tempo and he has a really strong grip on the light squares in the center which is the squares that you want to try and dominate as the black pieces which is you know kind of one of the whole points of the Cairo Khan so we just retreat the bishop of course if he goes g4 that's not really very good because bishop g6 if you take the h file is looking very very weak and if you go like g4 bishop g6 and play a move like bishop 2 f4 we could maybe even play moves like h5 but we don't have to do anything we can just develop normally and go yo what is this all about like knight e5 isn't even a good move we can take it but we can also just play moves like bishop to d6 queen to b6 that's not a great move so why did you spend so much effort to trying to force my bishop out i'm sure a lot of my lower rated viewers will probably get ideas like this if your opponents play an exchange Cairo with you just know it's good in basically all scenarios so um yeah he goes bishop to f4 which is a far more normal move i go e6 knight b to d2 and like i said i could have played a move like bishop to e7 but i know it isn't the best i know bishop d6 is one of the best ideas here and although I don't want to trade, you've got to be objective. It would be wonderful if our bishop could just sit here and his bishop be off somewhere else. And our bishop would be sitting under our umbrella of d5 and e6. A typical like London-y type of idea. And it would dominate the dark squares and everything would be dandy. You can't get everything. Takes, takes. Castle. We castle. Queen c2. He lines up this battery releases the pin it's fine rook a c8 a3 because like i said if he plays a move like rook okay well let's say rook f e1 because that's a more normal move then knight b4 queen b1 again you can't take because of the pin we exchange probably play bishop to g6 to attack the queen queen goes to like e2 we just have a nice position you don't have to do this move order necessarily but we have a very strong bishop. Maybe h6 is a bit better here to tuck the bishop on h7 so it can't get harassed with moves like knight to h4, which is a very common idea in like Slav and London structures. Something good to know. But yeah, we can tuck our bishop away. Our bishop dominates this diagonal. Very nice. So instead, a3 stops knight here. And we go rook f2 e8. Rook c7 was actually one of the best moves in this position. I kind of considered it, but I was like, eh, it doesn't look quite right trying to double up on the c file while it's still shut. I don't want to commit both rooks to it. So if I just go rook e8, it's a useful move. We're going to see what he does. And like I said, rook f e1, best move in the position. Far more natural than what he did. And, you know, the game just goes on. No one's got a massive advantage. White might be a little bit better just because he has a really nice grip over e5. But, you know, you just play chess. You play chess. Knight b3, though. This this is a perfectly fine move if we don't take on f3. But to be honest, e, okay, let's just say for argument's sake we go bishop g6 and this isn't a thing, right? Let's just say. And he puts a knight on c5. We can just kick it out. Maybe his idea was to get the knight to d3 to dominate the e5 square. But it's nothing special. Obviously, though, you just take on f3. Like, this is crushing. And yeah, here, I was between e5 and queen f4. Finally enough, knight h5 is actually the best move. And if you take here, you just go king h8 and say that white's wasting time like obviously there's no attack you're just winning a pawn because you can't swap the position of the queen and bishop around in which case it would be a problem but you can't do that 
and the queen has no access points along the light squares because we control all these squares, which is part of why the Kara Khan is great, because you just control all the light squares in the center. So, yeah, bishop d3, I assume knight f4. you got a big attack. You can even go for, like, I don't know, g6, king g7, rook h8, and make use of giving up the h7 pawn. I did consider sacking the h7 pawn. Like, it did cross my mind, but I was like, there's no need. Again, I explained this in the last video. Even if, objectively, it might be the best idea to sacrifice a pawn for activity, if there is another line that you know is basically winning, why not just go for that? Queen f4 isn't the best move here because of queen d2. But I... Oh, wait, no, not in this position, actually. Wait, queen d2 here, can't I just take? Sorry, I mixed up my move order. This is a very brave line to go for with white. <laughs> That's very brave. I don't know how... I mean, if you take this, it's completely losing, right? Okay, I don't know why the computer is recommending queen d2 then. I guess it just shows how bad the position is. Here, the computer does like e5, but black can do better. Black can do better. Queen f4. Again, like I said, there were a ton of different moves to defend the pawn. On bishop to e2. Knight h5 is good. I guess you're going to go queen to g5 check and knight to f4. If queen d2, then queen h4, you attack this and you get knight f4 in any way. This becomes basically impossible to defend. If you play like king h2, then knight f4, you're going to get mated unless you sack your queen. If you try to defend with knight to d2, then again, knight h5 is still a good move. Queen h4 is a good move, but... Knight d4 is the easiest move. Again, playing on this pin, your knight is now involved in the attack. If you defend with queen... Okay, queen e2 looks a bit more natural than uh, queen e1. Sorry, queen d1. Okay, queen g5 is good. Knight to h5 is good. e5 is good. On queen e2, my intention was e5 with the same ideas as I played in the game, except my rook is aligned with the queen, so it's probably even a bit better. But he went queen, uh, king to g2, which is probably the most natural response because it defends both pawns at the same time. But e5. Queen g5 check was a good move here. After king h2. The computer just wants to return to f4. So I don't really understand that. Again, knight h5 is an idea, but why give this up for no reason? Even if it's winning, I thought e5 was far simpler e5 and you can't you can't take this like i thought there was no way he was going to take and he spent like six minutes on that move the problem is there isn't anything good here like everything's bad uh push it to f5 was one of the lines that i had considered like i was saying but you can just move the rook you just move the rook and y your attack's still gonna happen d4 is still a problem Rook c d8 is the best move. Rook a e1. g6. The bishop can't go here because h5 traps it. So the bishop's got to retreat. Then, yeah, you can go for this whole, I don't know, queen g5 and knight to h5 idea. Might not be the most accurate. But this looks very winning to me. Very winning. So yeah, he takes. And what was what were some of the other alternatives? Rook a to e1. I love how a6 is one of the computer's top choices here. That's just so weird. Like imagine you play a like imagine I actually played that move. <laughs> like <laughs> then I would be definitely a hundred percent cheating. If someone plays a6 in this position, they are cheating. G6 makes a bit more sense to prepare knight to h5 by blocking this diagonal off. But simpler, queen g5, king h1. Although, I guess taking here is still good. Take. Taking with the knight maintains this idea, but your rook is undefended. So, I don't know, rook takes, knight takes, knight takes, pawn takes. You could even just go up a pawn if you wanted to. 
yeah, it's not the best, but you're still probably going to mate your opponent. Everything's winning here. But my t opponent took on e5. And like I said, you can take with the knight. That was my original intention, to put a ton of pressure on f3. And on bishop 2 e2, I thought I was just completely winning, which I am. Something like this, maybe. Not the most accurate, but it's game over regardless. But yeah, it's more accurate just to take with the rook and my opponent resigns because he can't stop my rook from getting in. His best move is rook g1. This is what I was expecting. But apparently knight h5 is good, rook h5 is good, rook g5 check is good, which is more forcing, so we'll look at that. The king goes to h1, take on f3 with check. This looks like it's game over to me. And if the king goes to f1, finally rook e5 is the best move. But obviously you don't repeat, because then he can repeat. So... You could just trade and... I mean, you could just trade and take on f3 if you wanted to. But I think it's probably more cl clinical to play rook to h5 here. Because how do you defend this pawn? If you go rook h1, then this check is better. Ah, because this comes with an attack. And if you go here, then I assume you give this check. And then all your pieces join the party. So, yeah, this is just game over if you play rook h1. Your best idea is probably just to run the king. And then I'm just winning two pawns. Your king is completely stranded. Again, it's game over. So, yeah, 17 move win in the Karo Khan. Look, it wasn't anything special. It's the exchange variation. We didn't get a massive advantage out of the opening. But that's not how, like, openings with black work. Especially when you start getting better at the game. You can't play... I mean, you can play dubious gambits. I do that with white all the time. But with black, I like to play nice and solid, really. And just cap capitalise on my opponent's mistakes. And my opponent's a good player. He made a mistake, and we capitalised on it. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you enjoyed, drop a like and subscribe. We'd really appreciate it. And I'll see you in the next one.